One of our goals is to get a dialogue flowing about the stories we're telling. We're hoping that you'll join the conversation. So connect with us on social media and let us know what your thoughts are, whether you agree with what you're hearing or not. Follow us on Twitter at Cooper McKim and at WY Public Radio with the hashtag Carbon Valley Pod. Today, on your favorite sports slash science channel, we bring you the Energy Cosia Carbon X Prize, a competition for the ages. $7.5 million is up for grabs for the team that best captures carbon dioxide emitted from a coal plant and turns it into the most valuable product. Five promising teams from around the world have been chosen to battle for the prize purse right here in the least populated state in the union, Wyoming. On one side, we have the contestants. There's an element of me that really, really, really wants to win just to show them they were wrong. At stake, a cash infusion large enough to help a young company leapfrog their peers and move fast to developing in the real world. Next up, you guessed it, the Earth. At stake, without serious action, climate change will bring devastating effects. This competition hopes to scale up companies who can remove those scary emissions. And Wyoming. I saw it as a silver bullet possibility for making coal more competitive. The state that produces the most coal in the country and whose economy is not doing great. At stake, a future market for coal, showing the world these power plants don't have to close. Their waste could make products. Imagine a world where everything around you is made from carbon emissions. From the products you use every day to the clothes you wear, to the roads you drive. And today, we begin to watch it unfold on the ground. From Wyoming Public Media, this is Carbon Valley. Following the race to develop an unlikely climate solution, I'm Cooper McKim. <clears throat> it's not easy getting out of that voice. In part two, we visit the Integrated Test Center for an important step of this process, where teams can air their dirty laundry, address bumps in the road, and start to actually set up plans here. On this hectic day, we get to know all the contestants. That includes our main character, who we met last episode, Jason Salfi. Jason is the underdog who entered the competition late. He's still down $500,000 and could use today to look to the competition for help. Um, welcome to Wyoming. Thanks. I'm is driving it, on some small road and um, looking at the vast horizon. It's now February of 2019, and Jason's on the road to the Integrated Test Center outside of Gillette, the test site where all the Carbon X Prize teams are expected to begin collecting data in just a few months. I'm about to get in the car too, from my home in Laramie, and head up there. I'm excited to get to know all the contestants, but also actually meet Jason in person. We've talked on the phone a bunch, but I have no idea what he actually looks like or acts like based on our calls. I imagine there are some visual signifiers of his laid back qualities, maybe long hair or bad posture or something. Anyway, today is the day where things start to get real. If your tech is having problems or you're hitting a wall, now is when to let the competition know. That'll all come through something called a design review. I asked Jason if I can sit in on his. Uh, boring. I know, but that's... No, 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 it could be super exciting. It could be like Survivor. Like, I don't yeah. Know, I've never actually seen it. We could be Me neither. Like, there's like a scenario where all of a sudden... We're around our design. Everybody's like, no, that's, that's not going to work, guys. You'll really get to see how mellow I can stay under stressful scenarios. Yes, yeah. we will see. On this cold, gray February morning, I jump in the car and head out on the four-hour drive to Gillette. Even though I've made the drive many times, the views always get me all prairie as you travel north. 
further you get from Laramie, the more pump jacks you notice, pumping oil and gas from the ground. As I drive, I start pondering what I've learned so far about Jason's life. And I wonder how this guy ended up leading an underdog team in dimensional energy in this competition. How this surfing, free diving dude ended up here. Well, let's see. So how did I get into this? Uh, how did I get into this world of yeah. carbon dioxide? Even where you, where, you, where you grew up to where you are now. Oh, wow. So I was born in Niagara Falls, New York in 1970. And um, we had, when I was in third grade, the whole Love Canal crisis happened. The Love Canal crisis, if you haven't heard, is a famous environmental disaster in the 70s where a chemical company used a canal to dump thousands of tons of chemical waste, displacing families and making lots of people very sick. So that, that introduced me to environmental catastrophe caused by industry. I was always intrigued because we had these sort of Love Canal refugees that ended up in my elementary school. And, you know, it just stuck with me. I was always intrigued by the role that industry played in our natural environment. And um, I ended up going to college for natural resources management. And fast forward a few years after that, I started a skateboard company focused on sustainability. I don't want this moment to pass without underlining how strange this is. The CEO of one of the XPRIZE teams is also a founder of a skateboard company. Who would have thunk? Jason Southie, as I said earlier, 75 years old and still destroying it. If you feel like cheering, we can use a little bit of energetic encouragement here. Jason started and led a company called Comet Skateboards in California for nearly two decades. That's a recording from an event he was actually skating at. The company was dedicated to making boards sustainably, with like special woods, inks, glues. He also describes the company as a movement meant to show young people how business can spread goodness and inspire manufacturers to use better environmental techniques. Comet had a skate team. They were ambassadors of fun and environmental sustainability. Full disclosure, I grew up skating and I am seriously jealous right now. Being with this skate crew would have been my childhood dream. I wanted to get an idea of what drove Jason back then. Was it all environment, all business, money? So I reached out to some folks in his former life. That includes Patrick Rizzo, or just Rizzo. Jason describes him as a spiritual leader. He's also a park ranger. Maybe that's why it took like two months to reach him. Rizzo said Comet helped a whole community think differently about skating. Right, like, oh wait, skateboards are awesome. They're like bicycles. And you can cruise around, you're not burning petrol. But those values went deeper, too. Rizzo says Jason spread the gospel of sustainability to young folks. And that kind of changed my life, really, more so than skateboarding ever would have, which was diet and, and more importantly, awareness of sustainability and where food's coming from. And that. So it sounds like Comet was kind of all about the environment for Jason though he admits the impact was not on a massive scale. Jason also started a youth environmental leadership program, so that's a thing. Eventually, this chapter of Jason's life came to an end. And in 2014, Jason continued down the environmental path. He moved from California to upstate New York and became an entrepreneur in residence for the state government focused on energy research. During his off hours, Jason started digging into this other thing called carbon capture utilization and thought, holy cuss word, this is huge. Jason thought this CCU thing could be a super effective way to address climate change, fill a niche of actually reducing emissions by burning fossil fuels cleaner that would be burned anyway. If we don't transition and acknowledge we need ways to make burning things cleaner in, in the march towards 100% clean energy, we're not going to get there. Renewable energy is great, but it's not enough, he says. Not moving fast enough. 
humans need to stop emissions now. For Jason, this super young field was the opportunity to fight climate change. Like a light bulb went off and said, finally, a thing worthy of devoting myself to completely. Yeah, there were, there were people doing a lot of really brilliant things in several different industries, all touching aspects of, of circular economy and sustainability that I could have seen myself going into and competing. And this one was wide open, brand new and untouched, early, still early days in, in the carbon to value space. And then the perfect opportunity presented itself to actually jump into this space. He was mentoring at an incubator and met these two scientists with young carbon capture utilization technology, something that could reverse emissions if developed. And soon he was CEO for a company he thought could actually move the needle for the climate, not just prevent future emissions, but reduce them like billions of tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. That's the dream anyway. Back then, it was just an idea. But he had a vision. Uh, Give me a little idea of the end goal for Dimensional. Say, uh, 10 years down the line, what you would ideally look like as a company. What we'd look like a company. As a company, I would say we would would have solid relationships with some of the largest energy producers on the planet. And we would be deploying our systems which are utilizing carbon dioxide as a feedstock in a way that we can displace processes today that lead to climate change. To get there, though, would take, like, more work than I can possibly imagine. He said it himself. This space is brand new, untouched. This show had to have a friggin' montage so you knew what carbon capture was. There's not exactly a how-to guide to develop a company like his. Um, But personally, you know, of course, I'm like, wow, this is a heavy lift. You know, it's thinking about like, you know, we're going to we're going to say take the waste product from combustion of hydrocarbons that that people have been pulling out of the ground for 100 years. Okay, let's take a beat. I'm just thinking, how normal is it for someone without a background in tech, really, to just be like, hold up, stop. I now see a shining light. My life is now devoted to this unproven technology. It's the holy grail of solutions. I just thought, yowza, this guy is not looking for an easy life. He's clearly driven by something, being willing to just jump headfirst into a thing that won't be quick and just feel totally comfortable doing it. I'm just thinking, is this real? Or is this just what Jason's trying to present? We had a conversation that helped me understand where he's coming from. This guy is indeed not looking for a comfortable life. This guy wants to play hero ball. Um, So what do you say? I I would not want to live in a different time, potentially. I'm wondering it. Would you, I guess, is the better question. Yeah, I I don't know. Uh, I think it would be interesting to time travel. That would help bring some data to that question because I don't know if I'd want to live in any different time. I really like this time. It feels to me like a very crucial time to live. We're at this like, I feel like this really interesting crossroads in, in human evolution. You know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we're watching the extinction of our, our species unfold but in a positive way, in a way. But as a result of all of the things that humans are doing right now, we are having a a profound impact on the planet. And something compels me to slow the rate of decay of our atmosphere, you know, right now. Here's what I'm hearing. I don't want to live in any other time because I can have the biggest impact right now. I live in some easy time where humans are doing great. I want to help. My comfort zone is discomfort if it means creating a better world. Imagine you're CEO of a company for a second. It'd probably be stressful, right? Now imagine that company is inventing technology to an undetermined customer 
in a field that's basically brand new, without any obvious examples of roaring success. That sounds to me like embracing discomfort. So I do wonder why Jason is really doing this. Is his reasoning really just about the climate? Or is there some secret promise of money that I'm missing? As I continue to drive up to Gillette, I try to play a song on Spotify, then remember there's no cell service anywhere in Wyoming. So I think about the day to come. I'm even more excited to actually meet this person. See if all this stuff, this confidence, is visible. Can be detected in how he talks or carries himself. I mean, someone described Jason as literal God last episode. Well, long before today, Jason faced a challenge that you might expect. He found leading this startup was harder than expected. Dimensional Energy's technology was improving, they were getting good data, but he just felt further and further away from getting them to market. It occurred to me about a year deep how challenging this space is, but but it could still see that it's possible. It just it's just it just hasn't been done before. So, of course, it's going to be challenging. He hit something of a wall, realizing just how long this technology was actually going to take to develop and make money. Was it all over? Would they give up? No. He just thought, let's find a way to move this along faster. Because you could spend the next two decades doing research in this topic and the subject matter and still not have anything commercially viable. Enter the Energy Cosia Carbon X Prize. An accelerator. It was the perfect opportunity for a young company like his to blast through these early roadblocks and surround yourself with people going through the same struggle. And then... We were actually um, told that we didn't make it into the final round back in the beginning of 2018. Dream over, back to square one, they didn't make it. Want to hear more podcasts with a Wyoming feel? On the modern West, we dive deep into rural despair and the resilience of small towns with stories exploring the evolving identity of the American West. On Human Nature, we tell first-person stories about human experiences in nature or catch up on state news with open spaces. And on Kids Ask Why, kids get to follow their curiosity by interviewing adults. Click on more podcasts at carbonvalleypodcast.org. At this point in the drive, I'm passing trains that are topped perfectly with coal, sneaking to each side of the horizon. We're in the middle of the drive, two hours in, still plenty of prairie to look at, don't worry. Right, so Dimensional Energy and Jason were not chosen as finalists. 10 other young companies were to compete for millions of dollars in prize funds and take their business one step closer to international fame and fortune, or something like that. There would be five teams to set up their pilot technologies in Canada and five at the site here in Wyoming. All that actual on-the-ground stuff, by the way, is set to begin within the next few months and wrapping up in 2020, where folks hope one of these companies could get started in subtle roots or inspire others to do the same, help jumpstart a carbon valley. Get jobs a moving. It's still funny to me that Jason could somehow be a saving grace for Wyoming coal. Carbon X Prize released a video at this point to introduce some of the teams who were likely at similar forks in the road of needing a push in taking their technology to the next level. To me, this felt like a movie preview to the contestants I'm getting ready to meet. Carbon Care's technology takes CO2 and converts it into stronger and greener concrete. Our process makes a very nutritious protein. From carbon emissions to bioplastic. Carbon negative biofuel. Plastics and other sorts of materials. Carbon nanofibers. Feeds for fish. Companies were chosen from all over the world. Just to start off though, I want to focus on one. A company called Carbocrete in Canada. They focus on using carbon dioxide to make concrete without the emissions usually involved in making it. Chris Stern is the CEO. I was sick and tired of hearing people being afraid of carbon dioxide. That's him in a YouTube video called Climate Change Makers, put out by the Carbon X Prize. Every finalist gets one. I did a double take at that title, though. 
Maybe because it just highlighted the tension of this whole story? Yes, climate change makers. That's what they want. But if Wyoming folks got to title why it's happening here, it would probably be closer to coal saviors or something. Anyway, Chris Stern spoke with a cool confidence. Like Jason, he talked about how new this industry was, how carbon capture utilization is the quote, wild west. We caught up later and I learned some of the basics of getting accepted to the competition. For one, he got half a million bucks as a reward for making it to the XPRIZE finals. But then Stern told us Carbocrete had to drop out. Basically it was gonna cost us between six and $8 million to compete, uh, which is about the prize money value should we have won. So it, was a, it would have been a huge investment and diversion of funds. Oof. I learned that because Stern's team dropped out, another one had an opportunity to get in as a finalist. Enter our main character, Jason Salfi. Participating in the Carbon X Prize is just an enormous opportunity to apply imagination to some of the world's most pressing problems. That video was Dimensional's Climate Change Makers video, by the way. Sound the royalty horns. Dimensional would have a shot at speeding up their tech's development fast and compete for the prize purse. <laughs> this would be an instantaneous, you know, accelerator for the company. We'd retain all that equity. We could pour that $7.5 million right back into the company and hire a bigger team, bigger facility, and start really pushing the envelope. All right. <sighs> Breathe deep. They made it. Jason's now got a big reason to speed up that time to market. It's sort of a double-edged sword, though, in my head, because, like, man, the pressure is on. You can't just move this company along at your own pace anymore. You got to move on someone else's timeline. So be as honest with, as you can with this question. What are you most nervous about with XPRIZE at this point? And remember that no one's going to hear this in, for over a year, so don't think about it too much. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I actually am not nervous about anything with X Prize. This just feels like a, a natural fit. I don't have any fear going into this. This is this is just super cool. I I don't have any expectations that our pilot is actually going to work. If it does, that's going to be awesome. But this is our first shot at bringing something out of the lab and into the field. You know, this is just an exciting opportunity, and uh, there's nothing really to be worried about. We're just going to throw it down and make it happen. Um. So maybe we're just very different people, but I tend to have anxiety about certain things, even if they don't matter. <laughs> so is there yeah. nothing is there nothing long term even that you're saying like, oh, maybe the pilot project doesn't work. That would really be a bummer. Or, you know, maybe we pan funding won't pan out or anything like that. Or are you just stone cold smooth? Um, I don't know. I feel like a, I like adapting and, a, and I like the challenges of that come up with things not working. I don't, it doesn't bother me. It just kind of keeps life interesting. Um, if everything worked, it might get boring. So, um, so I'm cool with it. It's, it's going to be. All right. Again, I'm just thinking, is he serious? Is he putting on an air of the confident entrepreneur? As his unexpected self-appointed audio biographer, I don't have the luxury of buying into a put on. I want to see it in person judge for myself how cool he can really be under pressure. And today, he will be under pressure. And we're finally nearing Gillette. I start to notice the famous coal strip mines as I'm driving. They always just look massive, like a historically large meteor crashed into the earth and also, you know, provide dang near half the cold of the entire country. I see monstrously large vehicles driving on the edge, said to dig up coal. As I get closer to Gillette proper, I feel a bit out of place, driving a smallish car, noticing the vast majority of vehicles are now trucks, most with company names on the side. Every business, hotel, gas station seems made with energy development in mind. It's a lifeblood. A working town like Gillette is not something I'm used to being from New Jersey, 
where everyone commutes and seems to work in different industries. As I keep driving, the buildings decrease, and I'm returned to the prairie, with folks driving to and from work. Folks raise their hand from the driving wheel and greeting. I still have to remind myself to do the same. It's this world, this economy, that Wyoming leaders really want to keep going. It's what they hope carbon capture utilization can help preserve through a competition like this, somehow through companies like Jason's, whether they know it or not, to keep folks from leaving here. So at this point, I need to start actually looking for the integrated test center which is great because I have no idea what it looks like or where I'm going. All I know about this place is what I've read. For one, it cost 21 million bucks. In 2014, Wyoming leaders appropriated $15 million of state funds to bring it into existence, with the rest coming from private industry. to foster the next generation of energy technology. The ITC will provide space for researchers to test carbon capture and utilization technologies using actual coal-derived flue gas from base and electric The ITC power website goes even portion. further. It says research at the facility will help support jobs, local, and state economies. With these grandiose ideas and hefty price tag, I imagine this place is a big glass building, that there's tech everywhere, all sucking up flue gas from the coal plant next door, called the Dry Fork Station. Now back in the prairie, I don't see the normal nothing. I instead see nothing with the occasional massive structure. Some storage facilities, shafts to transport coal, miles long railroad. Soon, I see the correct giant building. I drive through the security gate for the Dry Fork Station and see signs for the ITC. Soon, I see the building itself. And it is not what I imagined with $15 million behind it. From the outside, it's just a small white building with a trailer next to it that I learn is just a bathroom. It's freezing and gray as I get out of the car. I head inside and see this place is about the size of a big classroom with a few offices on the edge. I think back to that one video. Providing scientists a setting unlike anything achievable in a laboratory. The first step There's no tech on site. It's just kind of an office space. People are milling around, serving themselves coffee. Jason isn't here yet. There is lots of XPRIZE marketing. Stickers, posters, banners, a black hat with the word carbon. There's also those things you put around light switches with the words, you can thank coal. In my brain, I have to do a mental reset. What I thought would feel grandiose is not there yet. If this place is gonna provide jobs and keep coal going as its website professes, it's going to be a while. Today, we're in the idea stage. This competition has brought in people with visions. And so far, that's all it is. The ITC is more like the garage where Waz and Steve Jobs worked on Apple's first computer. That's the dream anyway. But I'm still excited to start finally asking questions, to talk to people about this young technology I have so many questions about. Some of the brightest minds in carbon capture utilization have traveled from around the world to be right here, to face off in a competition that I can only imagine will get fierce. I mean, with $7.5 million on the line, how can it not get intense? Everybody should burst into applause. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I will say it doesn't seem vicious quite yet. The vibe is more water cooler chats, but there's time. I take a seat to collect myself. I'm at the front of the room, pumping myself up to awkwardly introduce myself to like 15 new people over the next few hours. Okay, well, um, hey everyone, thanks for coming out, making the trip um, out to the ITC. Everyone knows I'm Michael Leach, Marcus Extivore. We're from the XPRIZE Foundation. We're running the car. Michael is a tall young guy who is not the famous college football coach. He's introducing all the teams as I look around and put faces to company names. Carbon capture machine, carbon upcycling, carbon this, carbon that. Michael also introduces me with a nice caveat. Um, feel free to give interviews, feel free to decline interviews, um, you know, do... Ah, come on, don't decline, go journalism! 
Three cheers for accountability. I'm also one of only two friggin' journalists here. Feel free to hang out here, make yourselves at home. This is your facility, so we want to get used to, uh, you know, using it and put family pictures on the walls and stuff like that if you want. Well, at least that's reassuring. If I'm going to track how vicious this competition gets, it would be helpful if folks do hang out on site. There can be no cold shoulder note without a shared space. It adds to the drama. Then Jason walks in. Our main character. He's red-faced from the near zero degree cold and looks distinctly unflustered. He's wearing all black with a big coat and has a white and gray beard. He looks around, blue eyes open wide. There's nothing to give away his history as a skater. But I'm still excited. This is the guy who's been referred to as omnipotent, called a god. I walk up and say hello, expecting some, oh boy, we finally meet. I present myself in greeting. Good to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you. How'd it go this morning? You sleep in? No, no, I had uh, had calls with people in Europe all morning, so I uh, I went to bed at 8 last night. (laughs) So so I I was up at like 4.30 or something. Off the bat, Jason seemed excited. He was all smiles and handshakes. Unlike me, I doubt Jason's first thought was the socially anxious, how am I going to make small talk? It was probably more like, I've made it. I'm here. That's the aura he gave off anyway. I try to make conversation, since this moment feels significant. The meeting of our main character in person. Yeah, pretty warm here, right? Yeah, it's not bad. It's kind of like what we've, it's been like this in Ithaca for the last couple weeks. So kind of used to it at this point. Cool. Okay. 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 But yeah. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Good to see you. Before you know it, the moment has passed. Poor me. The day is set to begin. There are meetings on deck with the state regulatory agency, design review, and a tour of the site. I'm thinking, what site? I didn't see a site. Someone with the ITC named Will Morris speaks up. He looks in his 30s or 40s, wears a green sweater, and has shoulder-length dark hair. He's sort of the safety guy and tells everyone they got to sign in and out of this building. Which way the wind is blowing. We don't want to be running around outside. It's very cold, very windy. Hypothermia is an issue. Um, But while the contestants aren't in meetings and apparently not outside, I ask each one to take them aside and get to know them. Four of the five teams are here. I wonder why are they participating in this competition, if it's about saving coal for them, as it is for Wyoming, if they even plan on staying in Wyoming once the competition is over, and get a sense of who they are. First, I take Sebastian Peter aside. He's balding, likely in his 40s or 50s, and has what I can only describe as a bubbly personality. He's got on a nice silver watch and white button down with black dots throughout. He's traveled the furthest, coming to Wyoming from Bangalore within India, I ask him what he thinks of Wyoming so far. But nobody's here in this part of the world. It's, it's so empty. It's so empty. Sebastian is focused on turning carbon dioxide into something called methanol, a high-octane, clean-burning fuel used in, say, cars or rockets. Sebastian says there are a ton of uses for methanol, though, and expects to make big money, especially as the world moves on from coal, oil, and gas, he mentions. Uh, an Indian government is initiating the methanol economy. Uh, it is uh, already in the process of gazetting 15% of methanol is going to blend with the petroleum by 2021. So it's going to be uh, commercialized. So you know the government is looking for uh, some uh, a team or industry and coming forward as an indigenous process of you know, methanol production. And he hopes now, Breathe is that team. Winning the prize would be a huge boost, like the fuel for them to get into the stratosphere. Well, if I win the competition, well, I can be a billionaire. Seriously. A billionaire? Oh, and he definitely expects to win. They have the highest net value, he says. I want to know why this tech is so important to him. I ask each team that question because I'm trying to start teasing out whether folks know Wyoming's interest in this competition 
is so based around coal, or if that matters. When I asked why Sebastian is doing work in this field, carbon capture utilization, it is indeed not about coal. Uh, the major component is science, money is attractive, and then of course climate change. All together, I would say all together. So, but the priority goes to science. I, I mean, but at the same time, of course, everybody loves money also. Of course, I also love money. Sebastian is my new best friend. I tell him that. Uh, just kidding. But he is super witty, especially for a professor of inorganic solid-state chemistry and nanomaterials. All the other solid-state chemistry professors I know? Total duds. Next up is a team called Carbon Capture Machine, here from Aberdeen, Scotland. I don't think your gender should decide what you do for work. You should do what you're passionate about, and you should do what you're good at. That's Zoe Morrison, co-founder of CCM, also a PhD, and the only female team leader within the five Wyoming Carbon X Prize teams. It's around this time in Wyoming that I realized the gender disparity so far in this series. So many dudes. What's that about? It seems to be the case within this whole world of carbon capture utilization, similar to the general STEM field, where it's notable enough that a co-founder dedicates her video to gender. Well, unfortunately, Zoe Morrison wasn't on site today. Carbon Capture Machine was represented by another co-founder, Dr. Mohamed Mbabi, PhD. He's short with a goatee and a busily striped green shirt. He seems very gentle somehow, just kind. XPRIZE connected me with Mbabi prior to today. So we actually talked over Zoom. He introduces their company, CCM, or Carbon Capture Machine. CCM also stands for Carbon Capture and Mineralization and Converting Carbon into Money, basically which define uh, what we do. He is coming in hot. Mbabi is all about confidence. My favorite part, though, this environment is definitely nerdy, and Mbabi walked into the ITC with this crew. He had folks with him from this Chicago firm to help with the company. It definitely felt like a flex. And he says they are going to win. They've got the best technology. Bada bing, bada boom, say hello to $7.5 million. Is there any team that you could see beating yours? Uh, no, I don't want to uh, um, uh, you know, sort of make predictions or to be too vain, but no. <laughs> CCM's technology? They use emissions to create carbonate minerals that apparently have high commercial value, used in, say, fireproof insulation or paints, plastics, adhesives. Okay, why are they the best? Well, they say they have the simplest process and can be made cheaply compared to competitors. On my journey to tease out why competitors are doing this work, I started in on Mbabi. And he was the first to give an answer that acknowledged Wyoming's interest in the competition. We have a technology that will make coal a very highly competitive fossil fuel because we get rid of the carbon dioxide emissions, which are the sort of biggest objection that people have the CO2. For Mbabi, of course, it's about the climate too. But he seemed to know his audience and appeared to be trying to sell me on them, saying their tech could be huge and truly contribute to this Carbon Valley dream. We are dead serious about doing something fantastic Gillette is going to be one of the first places in the world to see this in action. We've also got Dr. Wayne Song, PhD, head of C4X. Wayne couldn't make it to Wyoming today, so we actually caught up online. Wayne lives in Suzhou, China, near Shanghai. He looks to be in his 50s and wears rectangular glasses. He explains their tech converts CO2 into compounds that can be turned into antifreeze, electric batteries, plus a bunch of other stuff. Their tech looks like a small water tower. Immediately, it seems like Wayne is further along than the other teams, making him seem like a front runner, at least to me. He says several companies have already expressed interest in their tech, even Nike. Uh, uh, Nike, uh, shoe, the shoe company, uh, like an interest in our technology. So I visited Nike in Portland. So they, they say that they would like to sign an agreement. With... This definitely seems further along than Dimensional at this point. A potential customer already? Wayne also says this could be the last thing in his life that has great significance. 
all towards fighting climate change. Before our last team, I also want to take notice of how international this competition is. Having covered this state for four years, this is notable too. Because Wyoming has a definite trend of being insular, there are guffaws and scrawled bathroom messages yelling at green license plates to go home. Coloradans invading. How well would it go over to welcome in three international companies, let alone many more, if this all goes well? The last team is from California, the state which undoubtedly draws the most ire from Wyoming politicians, representing the monolithic left, the haters of coal. That point doesn't exactly come up with Carbon Upcycling UCLA, a team now called CO2 Concrete, making, you guessed it, concrete out of the flue gas of this coal-fired power plant. The team has a couple advantages. One, being in the U.S., fewer challenges in dealing with or getting to the site. Another, CO2 concrete can take flue gas straight from the plant. They don't need to purify it or anything, like some other teams do. That's a pretty big deal, I learned. These are your Carbon X Prize contestants. Vote now for who you want to win. The underdog? The meek? The swaggery? Well, voting is not a thing, unfortunately. But if it was, I would probably either take the team making concrete or Dr. Wayne Song's team. Jason is obviously up against fierce competition. After I interview all these folks, I walk over to Jason's office, where he sits focusedly typing on his own laptop. His hands on a notepad, his large black frame glasses sit next to him. I want to get a handle on Jason, too. Is he fielding customers like C4X? Have a leg up that I'm not seeing? I want to hear Jason's thoughts on these competitors, too, though. That he's up against doctors and professors from all over the world, within, like, the next year, with millions of dollars on the line. Um, let's see. So, so oh, were we intimidated by any of the teams? Uh, no, not at all. I would consider this a very collaborative competition, and I, I don't I don't have any reason to be intimidated by anybody. I just want to collaborate with people, and you know, if there's a, a point at which we can share a carbon dioxide sequestration and and concentration system, great, let's do that. If we have the ability to, you know, split off and utilize some some of the same capital equipment and save money for each other, like let's do that. For me, my passion is around world-changing solutions to some of the world's most pressing problems. Um, and so, you know, if someone is successful, um, we all win. But I can't help but think all the other competitors really want to win. Jason, though, just won't budge, won't say he wants to win, that there's a lot at stake. I don't know if that's what he really believes or what he's telling himself, but for now, I leave his office with more questions than answers. It's still only mid-morning on this cold, foggy February day. Everybody is in meetings or otherwise occupied. I leave Jason's office and just kind of sit, waiting in the main room at a plastic fold-out table. I look out the window and Sebastian's right. It's pretty empty outside this little facility. You can see prairie, a road, and not much else from here. I imagine a world where there's a factory out there producing concrete or fuel from the emissions of this coal plant. Five of them, 20. Would that be enough to start stabilizing coal production, even just this city's economy? And even if it does happen, how far away is this theoretical future? After all, we're sitting here today talking about rough draft blueprints for this tech. Tech that's stuck in a lab right now. All while coal companies continue to file for bankruptcy, left and right. I think back to the instigator of this facility, the Integrated Test Center, the guy who traveled back and forth to California to bring the XPRIZE here. Governor Matt Mead. He's no longer in office today, but the competition is finally here, at least for a day. I want to return to Mead's interview that you heard from last episode, just to remind you what he wants from all this. I really enjoy the opportunity to bring scientists, not just from the United States, but from around the world to Wyoming to showcase our state, to have that sort of environment in Campbell County and Gillette uh, to have people coming in from around the world who are, uh, have that ability to do that type of research, I think is a wonderful thing and, and leads to opportunities. 
Uh, and then the products itself, you know, we don't know which product or which uh, which team is going to win. But if you look at, you know, some of the products, whether it's cinder blocks, uh, whether it's petrochemicals. With Mead's comments in mind, I sit down with the guy who leads this whole Carbon X Prize competition, Marcus Extavor. We sit down in a different side office, still here in Gillette. He talks kind of like a coach, authoritatively, or maybe like from a TED talk. He's young, with styling red wing boots and a long sleeve shirt with the letter X for X Prize on his chest. Marcus says he's excited about what today means. It's not visible excitement, but I get it. Um, look, I just say that it's cool to be here today because we're sitting in a trailer next to an industrial facility. You know, it's a lovely trailer. But we're in an industrial trailer and we've got about 25 people in here that are talking about new technologies that they want to bring to industrial testing. And so on the one hand, it's kind of boring because we're just sitting around a trailer talking about engineering stuff. But this is kind of what industrial innovation looks like. After hearing from all these teams, I've learned a lot. The competitors seem very confident, excited, and not as defensive or anxious as I might have expected in a competition with so much on the line. No drama or teams at each other's throat. Even though there is a lot at stake for any of these teams. Even though it'll be really hard to actually scale up from the lab to outdoors in Wyoming. Marcus, though, reassures me. We're in the midst of the competition. It's very hard. People won't let on, but it's very stressful. The time pressure is immense. Um, the technology pressure is immense. It's very hard what we're asking people to do, but that's part of the exercise. We're really pushing people hard. We're optimistic and hopeful, but also extremely ambitious about how fast we're trying to push this and what's achievable. So there is a lot of risk. You know, maybe not every team is going to make it. Not every technology is going to work, but a lot of them are going to work. A lot of them are going to make it. And hopefully together, that can move the whole industry forward. That's what we're trying to do today. Well, even if there is lots of drama, from one bespectacled PhD to another, I still don't really have any idea how far any of these companies are from market. Is it possible? Are there other examples? Or are they genuinely playing with tech the world has never seen? Sebastian said he could be a billionaire. Is that true? I mean, to me, it would have to be that big if it were to have an impact on climate or honestly, coal demand. So next episode, I reach out to the people who actually have money on the line. Investors. Individuals who are willing to dig into their pockets because they believe in the commercial potential of carbon capture utilization. Next episode, we stay right here at the Integrated Test Center and begin to hear from those investors while also learning there are big challenges ahead for these teams. Next time on Carbon Valley. I was hoping they would write a check right there on the spot. Really? Absolutely. Some of the challenges of the XPRIZE teams become clear. Not just money, but timing, too. June is really, really short for us. Really short for us. Coming up in part three. The show is produced by Noah Greenspan and me, Cooper McKim. Anna Rader is our digital producer. Aaron Jones is senior producer. And we had production assistance from Micah Schweitzer and Chet Lewis. Music in this episode includes tracks from Ketza, Blue Dot, and Storyblocks. Our theme music is by Mark Juliana. Carbon Valley is a production of Wyoming Public Media. Interesting. My, my head's a little spinning right now because I'm I know, realizing can... what I'm doing. I'm actually like, oh, wow, I, I just was being tape recorded that whole time.